All right, good to see everybody here this evening. Welcome to the midweek service. Take a songbook. Let's sing together. 195, 195 in your songbook. Glory to his name down at the cross where my Savior died. Let's stand together to sing it. 195, Brother Bob. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Let's sing that last together. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy for soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. All right, good singing and uh, good to see everybody in church tonight. The Yoders are home. Amen. And uh, all in one piece, too. And uh, praise the Lord for that. And uh, wow, you had a trip, man. You drove all night, I heard. Is that true? Now, if he sleeps tonight, I'll let him, okay? But no one else is allowed. And uh, wow, it's good to see both of you. You look great. And uh, good to have you back home. Good to see Cindy Richardson here tonight, man. Up here with Dad. Yeah, spending time with Dad. And uh, he started the treatments. Uh, I heard he was pretty weak. Okay, prayerfully tomorrow. All right, we'll keep praying for Tom Hamby and say more about that in a little bit. Good to see you. And uh, she's her husband is pastor at Cross Ridge Baptist Church in Minnie, Kentucky, and a great church down there that they planted how many years ago now? Nine years. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Time goes by quickly, doesn't it? And uh, they've always been a, uh, there. Her... Um, mother-in-law steve's mom and dad were very influential in this church and uh uh keeping this church on track for years and uh just just great folks and uh good to have you tonight thanks for coming to the service all right let's open with a word of prayer shall we father we thank you for this evening thank you lord for another opportunity for us to be together here in the middle of the week and lord we're thanking you for bringing the yoders safely home and watching over them and for the repair of their car uh, Lord, for watching over them even during the accident. And Lord, we're thankful for the other visitors that you brought our way this evening, Lord. And uh, it's good to be in the house of God tonight. Good to be with the people of God. And Lord, I pray you'll give us what we need tonight. I pray that each of us right now would yield ourselves to you and ask you to minister to us tonight. Help us to put out of our mind things that would uh, concern us, things that would occupy our thoughts and would keep us from hearing and listening. Uh, to what you would want to say to each of us this evening. So, Lord, have your way in every heart and life, and may you be pleased with our service this evening. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Would you turn with me to number 413, 413? I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, but love lifted me. 413, let's sing that first together. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the water lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, 
Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. All my heart to him I give, ever to him I'll cling. In his blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best song. Faithful, loving service do to him belong. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Souls in danger look above, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. Like the of the sea, billows he will obey. He, your Savior, wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Amen. Anyone else? This evening's uh, missionary message is from Mike and Nettie Nulloff, uh, missionaries to Canada. Dear friends at Bible Baptist Church, we learned last week that the wife of a man who attends our services is very close to death. Due to long neglected gallbladder problems, she has developed a serious infection. Mike went to visit her in a hospital and found her to be a very kind woman, but resistance to spiritual counseling. When he asked her about being prepared to meet the Lord, she replied that she had no worries about that at all. She went on to explain that her father, who now passed away, had met and talked with two different people who had experienced near-death experiences. Both individuals described death as being very peaceful, quiet, and restful. They spoke of a long tunnel with a bright light at the end. Because of this, her father determined that death was not to be feared and that no preparation for death was necessary. The daughter Margaret now believes this. She is very firm in her conviction that people do not need to be saved, converted, or even religious. She refused to let Mike share scripture with her or even pray for her before he left. She did this politely but firmly. Please pray that the Holy Spirit will be with, with her to reach which is sincere but lost, near to death but not to God. We'd also be grateful if you pray for our Sunday morning services. Mike has been preaching through the book of Revelation. Each Sunday, he has been emphasizing the Lord's efforts to bring people to repentance by the way of judgments, seals, trumpets, and vows. In spite of his efforts, the people of that day will steadfastly refuse to repent. He is ending each message with a warning not to prepet, the definition being repeat an action before it is performed. This future refusal to repent. He knows that his word does not exist, but the prayer is that it will awake those who are not saved to come to repentance. We know of at least four people who claim to be saved, but their lifestyle seem to indicate otherwise. Our son Jeff has had his annual medical checkup. The doctor said other than his cerebral palsy and epilepsy, he is in good condition. We really praise the Lord for this blessing. Every week when we go to church, Jeff tells us he wants to be up front 
By this, he means he wants to lead the singing, teach in Sunday school, and preach from the pulpit. Each time he says this, I think of the day when he goes to heaven, he will indeed be able to do these things. Sorry. It makes me think of the many young people today who could teach and preach but have no interest. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Thank you. Uh, Bible Baptists have supported the Nulfs for probably over 30 years or something at least that it's a long time up there doing a great job and um, that's that is a blessing about their son and what a what a great spirit uh, to have and uh, that's great um, listen let's take just a moment we're going to go into the prayer guide and we'll go over that but let's take a minute while you're getting that out let's welcome our guests that are with us this evening and uh, we have some folks visiting with us tonight we want to meet them find out who they are and where they're from um, you're visiting tonight. Let's see. Yoders, you have a guest with you. I, I know who it is, but uh, why don't you introduce him to the church? You going to do that, Brother Dave? It's my oldest daughter, Jennifer. Great. Wonderful, wonderful. Jennifer, great to see you. Good to have you in church tonight. Thanks for bringing that nice California weather with you. And uh, we've enjoyed it. We've had this... The last time we had what has been nine or ten days now without any rain, it was 2012. It's been four years since we went this long without rain, so hallelujah. And, uh, but I think it's going to start raining tonight. I think the odors have seen enough rain, haven't you? Yeah, they were in Texas. Texas has gotten hammered with rain. So uh, good to have you tonight. Thank you. Okay, uh, who else? We have a young man right here. Yes, sir. Tell us where you're from. Okay, Jeremy, good to have you tonight. Thanks for coming. Appreciate you being in the service. Now, the young man on the back row was here last Wednesday night, and uh, we weren't here. We were at the RU conference, and uh, he's back this evening. Tell us your name and where you're from. Okay. Fantastic. Patrick, good to see you tonight. Great. Uh, this young man right here, go ahead. Uh-huh. Amen. Met Jonathan at the RU conference, and uh, he uh, helps uh, in Dave Chaffin's Sunday school class uh, down at Anchor Baptist. And so he knows Brother Dave, and good to have him visiting with us tonight. That's wonderful. All right. Of course, I introduced Miss Richardson earlier. Cindy's here. Anybody else tonight that I'm not? I think the rest of us. All right. If you'll take just a moment and fill out the visitor card, we would appreciate that. In a little bit, we will have an offering, and you just drop that card in the plate if you would. And keep the pen as our gift to you for coming tonight. We're glad you're here. All right. Let's give them all a warm welcome, shall we? All right. Now take your uh, prayer guide, if you would, please. And uh, take that out. The coming events, of course, pray for the RU Inside down at CRC tomorrow night, 630 to 830. And then, of course, the RU program right here on Friday night at 7 o'clock. And uh, the RU Inside at London uh, on Saturday morning. And then, of course, our soul winning and bus visitation at 10 a.m. on Saturday. And then right on through some of the future events there that we appreciate you keeping in prayer. Uh, above that, remember to keep Stacy Anderson in your prayers. Uh, Stacy's mother passed away this last Sunday, and uh, she is in California. And uh, don't know any of the arrangements yet, but I uh, sure appreciate you praying for her as she has to say goodbye to her mom. Okay? And then on the inside, we uh, praise report for those who were uh, made professions of faith and were baptized on Sunday, and uh, we rejoice with them. A good report from the prison uh, Thursday night. There were seven saved, and they had 15 at London on Saturday. And, of course, good to have the Yoders home from Texas. That's a praise report. Amen. And um, continue to pray for those on the health list, and as you do, and uh, praying for our leadership in our country and those in authority, even locally here. <clears throat> praying for those in the military who defend our country and uh, for their protection, praying for these who battle cancer, uh, especially pray for Brother Hamby, and let's ask God to strengthen him that he'll be able to start these treatments that could be a help uh, to his situation, all right? And uh, continue to pray for these on the salvation list, and then, of course, the unreached people groups and uh, the different 
nations that are mentioned there. And uh, again, we're just lifting up these folks in prayer that God would send forth laborers to reach these people for Christ. All right. Um, 80. I think the last statistic I saw, it's like 87 percent of our missionaries go to like 22 countries of the world. Uh, that leaves about 13 percent to go to the other 200 nations of the world. So uh, we, uh, I think God's calling. I think people have to be willing to go. Amen. Amen? So we want to pray for the Lord to send forth laborers into the harvest. And, of course, our missionaries uh, highlighted tonight by the Nulfs up in Canada, uh, that they'll continue faithful and that God will uh, bless in that preaching on Sunday morning and impact the lives of those uh, who are attending the church there. All right. And uh, also, uh, pray for the Levine family. We got an email from them, and I want to I want to just share it with you briefly. Um, they they said we have been unable to secure a long term visa for the upcoming months. We will have to leave Nepal for at least two months before we make another attempt at securing an alternative long term visa. As of late, Nepal has changed the policies for foreigners trying to secure long term visas. This has made things more challenging for us. We have weighed our options and in place of returning to America are merely vacationing in a nearby country for two months. We have decided that the best plan of action is to leave Nepal within 10 days, travel to China, and live in an area where we will have the opportunity to continue to minister among Tibetans while we await for the next visa processing time. All of this came as a surprise to us and came with a great expense that we were not prepared for. We are thankful to the Ministry of All Points Baptist Mission, which was able to release necessary funds from an emergency account for us to be able to take the steps in order to put this plan in motion. The cost of the unexpected journey will exceed $7,000, which includes flights, visas, and a temporary apartment in China. We're thankful for your prayers and support and would ask that you would pray about helping us with these unexpected expenses as we have every intention to replenish the emergency account of All Points Baptist Mission. We hope to use our time in China to survey the local situation, which may even include a possible trip into Tibet itself. Please pray for a profitable trip. Pray for Nepal as the government is created and is trying to create new laws that affect the Christian community and threaten the evangelistic efforts of both nationals and expatriates. Other foreign Christian workers have found themselves in a similar situation where they have limited to no options for long-term stay in Nepal. So pray for Levines and pray for that situation uh, to get resolved. And uh, Brother Larry Smith, who's an evangelist, his son, Robert, is a missionary down in uh, Barbados, West Indies, and they're facing a very similar situation. They're waiting on their paperwork, and the government, again, is changing the the rules making it more difficult for missionaries to stay and so uh, they're asking for prayer that their paperwork will get approved as well so we want to pray for these missionaries as we can and uh, brother Yoder I'd like you to come and pray for us tonight since you're home and uh, glad to have you back and I want you to lead us in our prayer this evening and especially pray for these missionary families tonight unite our hearts together as he leads us audibly pray along with him silently it keeps your mind from going to places and not not paying attention but as he prays, you pray right along with him. And let's unite our hearts together as he leads us, all right? Brother Dave. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do come to you tonight very thankful. Thankful that we can come directly to you through Jesus Christ. Thank for his precious blood. We'd ask now for these requests that have been made for the Knopf family there in British Columbia, Canada, that you would encourage them and be with them. I pray for these families that he mentioned specifically in his letter that are close to death that have been deceived I pray Lord that they would uh, seriously consider their soul and the, the great length of eternity before they turn things off completely I pray that the Bible that's been given to them and the wisdom of their pastor would uh, help them realize that it's for eternity and uh, Lord continue to work with that We'd ask for the young people there that uh, have burdened him in a great way. And, Lord, we sense the same thing here, that just being overcome by materialism and the, the, the uh, capturing of the heart for things that happen right now instead of the things of God, we'd ask, Lord, that you would uh, awake some of those people that he's talking about specifically and help them. 
Lord, we thank you for the good testimony that he's had over the years, and we'd ask that you allow it to continue. We would pray for Stacy Anderson and uh, the situation she's going through there with her mom. I pray that you'd keep her safe and uh, that joy would be brought to the family even through this situation. I would pray for Brother Hamby. I pray that you'd help him with these treatments now. Lord, I pray that he would not uh, be in pain. Uh, Lord, you know what his condition is and why he has to go through this. But we'd ask that you'd strengthen him uh, physically. I pray that he'd continue to be a good testimony spiritually to his family. We pray for Mrs. Richardson here tonight that you would bless her. I pray for Brother Levine there in uh, Nepal. Lord, you know the uh, tremendous asset he is to the mission world and all, all the different things that he does concerning the translating and so forth. I pray, Lord, that you'd protect their family. Lord, we've got to have them on the mission field. So I pray, Lord, that you'd give him wisdom as he goes to China and tries to work w with things in Tibet. I pray that you'd help them. Lord, we w do pray for the unreached people groups. Lord, thousands of them all over the world, and yet we're so comfortable here, yet we have the Bible, yet we know the truth, and on and on and on we could go because we've been so blessed. Lord, we don't want to take that for granted, so we would pray for them tonight. I'd ask that you'd help them. Lord, we thank you for the tremendous news that we've got from the RU program and the prison ministries, all that has taken place this uh, past week in Rockford and so forth. And I pray that you'd continue to bless. I pray that you'd keep your hand on our workers here. And, Lord, I pray they would not be weary in well-doing. Again, we thank you for uh, the results that we've been able to see uh, because of your mighty hand. I pray now that you'd be on our pastor tonight as he brings us the word of God. I pray that you would speak to us through your word to help us to be the kind of Christians that we ought to be. We love you, and we thank you for allowing us to be here. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Number 75 in your hymnal, 75, there's a land that is fairer than day in the sweet by and by. Let's stand together as we sing number 75 together on that first. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Amen. Greet one another. Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together.
shall sing on that beautiful shore the melodious song of the blessed, and our spirits shall sorrow no more. Not a sigh for the blessing of rest in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore. Let's sing that last together. When we get to the chorus, we'll have the pianist drop out and we'll sing that a cappella. On that last together, to our bountiful Father above, we will offer our tribute of praise. For the glorious gift of his love and the blessing that hallow our days in the sweet by and by we shall meet on the beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that seated and the ushers will come and get our offering tonight we'll take this offering in for our country fair coming up it's uh, coming up quickly all right may the 21st this is april the 20th we're just a month away and uh the flyers have been ordered they'll be here in just another week or so and uh we're ready to kick off operation saturation right around the first of may and uh, we'll be ready to go. So uh, let's let's give towards that day and uh, be praying for that day that God will give us many souls to be saved on May 21st. All right. Let's pray for the offering tonight. Father, thank you for the privilege. It's ours to give. Pray your blessing on our giving tonight. Lord, we pray for the country fair that, Lord, you'll touch the hearts and be preparing the hearts of people whom you'll have to come. Uh, some who will plan on coming, some will just drive by and see the activity and I want to come see what's going on. Bless the gospel as it's given out that day, that the hearts will be open and receptive. We'll see many folks come to know you as their Savior on that day. May you help us to plan well and prepare well and pray well that we might see your hand of blessing upon that big day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, take your Bibles this evening if you would. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 14. The Bible says, Be, not, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, 
saith the Lord Almighty. Father, add your blessing to the reading of the Scripture this evening, Lord, and as we prepare once again to look into your Word, I pray, God, that you would open our understanding, that each of us would yield to thy Spirit tonight, that he would teach us your Word, or to help me and bring to my mind and my heart things that I ought to say, and Lord, things that I ought not to say, then keep me from saying them. And I pray you'd help me as I bring the study, and please help the folks as they listen this evening. And I pray that your will will be done. We would leave this place being better servants of thine, because we were here tonight. And I pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to talk to you tonight in our continuing our series here on separation, on four decisions of separation. Four decisions of separation. You ever, you ever gone to the altar? and made a decision uh, that God had spoke your heart about something, and maybe in, maybe in the area of separation, uh, something you knew you should stop doing or you don't need to have in your life anymore, and you make the decision and only realize in about two weeks or maybe a month, you're right back where you started. And uh, it, it, you get a little discouraged with that. And, and by the way, it's not because you weren't sincere when you made the decision. You were sincere. God had touched your heart and you were genuinely repentant in, in a broken hearted over maybe something you had done or said and you decided you're not going to do that way. But listen, the problem is you have to understand separation. You have to understand what's involved with being separate. We, we preachers like to just say it's simply separating from the world and being separate unto God. And it is. But, but that's not one step, that's a series of steps. And, and we're going to look at those steps this evening, all right? And, and it's, I call it the four decisions, if you will, of separation. I think it's, there's a series of moves that you make to separate from and get unto God, all right? And they're found here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. So let's look there. Verse number 17. Here's the first decision that's made when it comes to separation. God says in verse 17, Wherefore, come out from among them. Come out from among them. That's the first command that God gives. And by the way, it is a command. God isn't suggesting it. He's commanding it. All right? And, and He's telling us this is what we do. Now, uh, can, you, can you refuse to obey a command? You can. You'll pay the consequences if you do. But you can refuse to obey the command. But God is saying here, you have to come out from what is wrong and so you can come to me. You, you have to make that first conscious decision that I'm going to come out from what God says is not right. From what God says is wrong. And it's a willful, conscious decision. It doesn't, look at me, it doesn't just happen. Not any more than salvation just happens. Okay? Nobody, nobody ever got saved by saying, you know, I just kind of was going along one day and boom, all of a sudden I think I was saved. Uh, it doesn't, didn't just happen. All right? Uh, it's a conscious decision. You, somebody, or you read or somebody showed you or you had knowledge of what the Bible said about how to become a Christian what you needed to do, and you had to make a conscious decision that you would put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And it was a conscious decision. And you have to make that conscious decision as the Spirit of God convicts you from the Word of God. You make that decision, I am going to stay away from that. I'm going to remove myself from that. And it's a conscious decision. Now, hold your finger there. We'll come back to 2 Corinthians 6. Look at John chapter 7. The Gospel of John, chapter 7. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John 7. <clears throat> I'm going to make a statement to you, and, and I want you to understand. Separation is not based on understanding. Separation is not based on understanding. Notice John 7 and verse 17. If any man will, what's the next three words? Okay, that's three of you. If any man will do his will. If any man will what? Do his will. If any man will do his will, 
he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Does it say if any know of the doctrine, then do it? No. He says you do it and then you'll know. The separation is not based on my understanding. It's my obedience to God's Word that brings the understanding. I obey by faith. I obey. What's faith? I obey because God said so. And because God said so, then my understanding will come. So I'm to separate. I'm to come out from among them whether I understand that or not. Whether, see, so it takes, you know what that does? It takes this, well, I just don't see. Well, I don't understand what's so bad. Because we're basing it on, on our feelings, or, or while we see it, or our understanding of it, and that really has nothing to do with it. If you, if you looked at your child and you said, listen, um, we're, all right, somebody, um, I'll tell on Courtney. Um, Courtney had a little boy, Jackson. How old's Jackson? He'll be two, okay? And uh, Jackson came in today and he picked his nose. Hey, two-year-olds pick their nose. It's all right. No, you know what you say? Hey, we don't do that. Now, suppose the two-year-old says, well, I don't understand what's so bad about picking my nose. What's the big deal? I feel it's okay. Are you going to accept it as a parent and say, oh, well, of course, until you understand what's wrong, I guess it's okay, pick away. Huh? No, you're not going to do that. You're going to say, listen, how many of you grew up in a home to where <laughs> your mom or dad said, I said so, and that's all that matters? Huh? Anybody grow up like that? Hmm? My dad said it. He would say, that's, that's it. It's not open for discussion. And I meant that, that, was, the, that was the law. It was done. Okay? And listen, God, God says, this is what you're to do. Come out from them. And don't, don't you try to understand. Don't you try to think it through. Don't you try to, well, I don't feel like it's such a bad thing. It doesn't matter what our feelings are. It doesn't matter what we, how we see it. It matters what God says. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto what? Your own understanding. Okay? And so separation is not based on understanding. I obey the command of God whether I understand it or not. I obey the command of God whether I feel it or not. I still am to obey the command of God. I, I'm to live by principles and not by my feelings. Okay? The initial decision of separation is come out from among them. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, when he says come out from among them, who's them? Okay, the world specifically, who did he just talk about? In verses 14, 15, and 16. He talks about unrighteousness. He talks about darkness. He talks about Belial. Sure, he talks about infidels. People who don't believe. He that believeth with an infidel, an unbeliever. What agreement that temple of God with idols? Idolaters. He's talking about the, the, the people who don't want to acknowledge God at all in their life. Which is basically, yeah, the world system. And those people of the world. The world right now is, is listen, uh, they have no regard for God, no regard for His truth. I was sharing with our teachers in teacher meeting tonight. I, I didn't see it. I just saw the headline about it where... Some folks were upset that uh, that program, Saturday Night Live, did a parody on the God is Not Dead movie, and they really mocked God and mocked prayer. My friend, when, when that's acceptable in our country, nobody's up in arms about that. Now, I guarantee you, had they mocked Allah or said something about Muhammad, we would have heard all kinds of outrage. But America has turned her nose up at God. And, and it's not a big thing to, to say that about God anymore. That's the world in which we live. And God says we have to come out from among them. Okay? We have to do that. We have to make a decision. Listen, we have to make a decision that I stop doing something that violates the Word of God. If I, I'm doing something in my life that I know violates God's Word. I have to stop making excuses for myself. I have to stop uh, trying to sugarcoat it and just say, God says that's wrong. It's wrong. I need to get it out of my life. 
I need to come out from among them. Now, notice the second thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. He says, Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate. Now when he says come out from among them and then he says be ye separate, what he's literally saying is come out from among them and burn your bridges. Burn your bridges. It's not come out from among them and leave a path to go back in case you want to. It's come out from among them and and don't leave a way to return. Remove the ability to go back. Break the ties. Do not leave a means of returning to the old life. If you're going to... Hey, how many of you in the room ever have... have, uh, one time you smoked cigarettes and you, you've quit cigarettes now and you don't smoke anymore. You beat that. Look, quite a few, okay? If I'm serious, if you're serious about quitting smoking, then when you decide to quit, you still keep a pack up in the cupboard just in case, right? You still keep one in the pocket just in case you get a hankering, you know? No. What do you got to do? You got to burn the bridge. You got to make it. It's not available. It's not, it's not going to be around. If I, if I didn't want to drink and I don't want to have any alcohol, then I better, not, I better get the beer out of the refrigerator. Then I can't keep that around anymore. Because, listen, if there is a way to go back, you'll go back. If there's a way to go back, you'll go back. If the decision is to dress modestly, so the decision is, and you, you, you learn and grow as a Christian of how you ought to look and how you ought to dress, then what you need to do is get rid of the clothing that is not appropriate anymore. Don't own something that you should not wear. Sometimes people say, well, what, what is that? What, you know, she's wearing that and it's not it's showing way too much. Well, why do you even own something that shows way too much? By the way, don't. Just, just get rid of it. Don't leave it and, and get the decision to get rid of the wrong things, get rid of them. If you decide I'm going to give up the rap music, the rock music, and the, all that garbage, then what do you do? Don't sell your collection and pollute somebody else. Let me, let's look at what they did in the Bible. Look in the book of Acts. Will you go there, please? Look at Acts 19. Acts 19. I can tell you're enjoying this so much. <laughs> Yeah, two or three of you, you know. Acts 19. There, there were, uh, let's start up in verse 13 so you get the, the setting of what's going on, all right? Certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And this man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And fear fell on them all in the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed showing their deeds. So Christ was magnified. Many believed in Him. They confessed their faith in Him. And then they showed their deeds. What's that mean? Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together. And what did they do? burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found 50,000 pieces of silver. So they took all the garbage they had and when they confessed Christ, they said, I don't need this junk in my life anymore, so I'll put it on eBay. Well, they didn't have eBay back then. They Jerusalem Bay or whatever they had then. You know, but they, listen, you know what? They didn't sell it. They, they, they did uh, figure out how much it would cost. How many of you think 50,000 pieces of silver? I don't know what it cost then, but that still sounds pretty good now. But they said, no, I can't give this to someone else. And they got rid of it out of their life. But listen, once they did that, what happened in verse 20? So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. 
Say, well, I don't, you know why sometimes people struggle to have an appetite for God's Word? You've got too many other things that are taking up, choking it out of your life. Too many other things that ought to get out of your life. You haven't come out and be ye separate, saith the Lord. You have to burn the bridges. So there's two decisions so far. Come out from among them and be ye separate. Burn the bridge. Don't go back. If you're mindful to go back, you'll go back. You have to burn the bridge. Number three. Number three. Then he says, touch not the unclean thing. Touch not the unclean thing. Come out from among them. Be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing. That's not necessarily physically touching it. But I think what he's referring to here is more that, that we mentally stay out of touch with it. You know, you can leave something and never mentally leave it. You can physically be away from something but never mentally be away from it. You can, you can quit smoking but still think about having a cigarette. You can, you can quit pornography and still think about looking at immoral pictures. And get in your mind. And so you can say, oh, I haven't looked at anything lately. How, how have you, how's your thinking been? You, you can't let your mind dwell on it. The example of the Old Testament, Lot's wife. Lot's wife. As they went out and Lot and his wife and their two daughters and as the angels got them out of the city, what did Lot's wife do? She looked back, didn't she? She looked back. And God turned her into a pillar of salt. Physically, she wasn't in Sodom anymore. Physically, she obeyed. She came out from among them and was separate. But where was her heart and mind? It was still back in Sodom. And so she turned and looked back. You, gotta, you have to touch, not the unclean thing. You have to get out of touch. You ever, you ever have somebody talk about something that they, they think you know all about it and you know nothing about it? And you feel like, man, I'm out of touch. You know, uh, we, we don't use that phrase so much anymore. We say, I'm clueless or something like that. But, you know, we say, man, I, I must really be out of touch. You know what I mean? Because we don't even, we didn't, that didn't even enter our mind. That's where you have to get. God says, I want you to come out from among them. I want you to be separate. Now, don't want, I want you to be out of touch with the unclean things of the world. Abraham came out of Ur of the Chaldees. In fact, look at Hebrews 11. Would you turn back there? Hebrews 11 talks a little about Abraham and the hall of faith here. Hebrews 11. Are you doing all right? Everybody okay? Hebrews 11. Verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them, and embrace them, and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But they desire, but now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. That's Abraham. He left Ur of the Chaldees. He never went back to Ur of the Chaldees because he never thought about going back. They weren't mindful of the country they came out of. He kept his mind on the country he was going to. The Bible says he looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. We, we're, we're to be, listen, it ought to be easy for us to leave behind the things of the world because our affection is to be set on things above, not on things on the earth. And if our affection is set on things above and we're looking for the city whose builder and ruler is God, then it's easy to leave behind these things. We have to get our focus on what's right and we touch not the unclean thing and we don't think about it, we don't look back. Now go back to the book of Psalms with me, will you? Psalm 101. Psalm 101, the 101st Psalm. If any of you have ever been in our Christian growth class, um, 
you've been in the Christian growth class, right beside Psalm 101, what do I tell you to write down? Does anybody remember? The TV song. Did you know there's a psalm in the Bible about the television? Well, now you'll know. Okay, here we go. You ready? David said, look at verse 2. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within, where? My house with a perfect heart. So now David's talking about, I'm walking in my house. And he says in verse 3, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Uh Uh-oh. Where is he now? He's not outside, is he? Where is he? He's at home. He's at his house. And I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. Nothing on television makes you turn aside from God. Hello? Don't bow your head. It's not time to pray. Nothing on television. He says, won't cleave to me. How about a froward heart shall not shall depart from me? A froward heart is one that will not yield to what they're told to do. A froward heart in Proverbs is someone who will not submit to authority. Nothing like that on television, is it? Everybody listens to their authorities. Well... I will not know a wicked person. I'm sure glad there's no wicked people on television. Whoso privily, privately, slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Nobody slanders anybody else on television, do they? They don't talk bad about their neighbor or anything, do they? You know what David said about that? He says, I cut them off. The Bible's pretty practical, isn't it? I will not know a wicked person. He that slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath a high look and a proud heart, will I not suffer. No proud people on television, are there? Any proud people there? You see, yet when, when, when God talks about being separate and touch not the unclean thing. Being out of touch with the unclean things. You know, you know where we get in touch with the most unclean things? Is right there. And it is amazing what we would never do ourselves, but we sure like watching other people do it. Things we would never say ourselves, but we let people come in through that. You say box, now it's just a screen. <laughs> and say something. I'm telling you, I'm not preaching against television and throw your TV set out, but listen, if you can't handle it, it one way to know, tell yourself you're going to go a week without, it, without any TV at all. If you have a hard time with that, then you've got a problem with TV. If your flesh fights that, then you've got a problem with it. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. We never watch anything where they lie and deceit and deceive people, do we? No, no. I will early destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all the wicked doers from the city of the Lord. Some interesting things to consider and ponder there. Now, let me teach you something from James chapter 1. Some of you in Reformers Unanimous will will get this, but James chapter 1. The Bible says in James 1 and verse 14 that every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. He's drawn away, he's lured The idea of us, we're walking on the path serving God and Satan tries to lure us away. How? By our own lust. Our own desires. And and we get, he, he puts the things out there that get us to draw off the path. The path of pleasing God and the path of living for God. But notice, I want you to notice, we get enticed and it says, when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. Conceived, 
of, you know, in the Bible, conceived, obviously, conception and in, in, in a relationship. But the, the word conceived here means this. It means it's framed in your mind. What do we do? We see something. We start thinking about it. And pretty soon we start framing in our mind how we can make it happen. If it's, to, if no matter what it is that we're going to do wrong, or we're going to do that we don't think we ought to do, we use the term sometimes that we fall into sin. Most of the time we don't fall into sin. We thought about it. We framed it in our mind how we could, we could do it, and then we carried it out. Well, that's quiet. You see, it's, it's for letting it frame in your mind. Some of you, you, you haven't committed a sin yet. You haven't gone off the path yet, but you framed in your mind how it could happen. Well, I can, I can go here. I can tell somebody I'm going to go here, and I can really get over here, and I can get that done. I can get back here before anybody knows I'm gone, and we frame it in our mind. Amen? It's true. So what do we do? 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. You're in chapter 6 there, 2 Corinthians, just a couple pages to your right. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Notice verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Any imagination or high thing that exalts itself against what we know to be true about God. Anything that we begin to think, and as soon as we know, that's not what God says. What do you do? Cast it down. God, get that thought out of my mind. Please help me. And immediately cast it down. And what do you do? You bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I want to bring my thinking in line with the Bible. I want to bring my thinking in line with what the Scripture says. So, how do you do that? You hide God's Word in your heart. So that when the wrong thought comes, you cast it down and immediately you replace it with what God says. And you bring the Scripture to your mind. That's why meditation, memorization and meditation is vital. That you have God's Word there and the Holy Spirit will bring it to your remembrance. And there are times... Verses I've memorized or verses I've known. And listen, there are times I haven't thought about a verse for, for I don't know how long. And you'll be counseling with someone or witnessing to someone. And man, the Spirit of God will bring that verse up and you'll say it and think, wow, where'd that come from? I haven't thought about that verse in a long time. But you've got to give the Holy Spirit the ammunition to work with. I've, I've memorized that verse and, and hit it in my heart. And you know what? The Holy Spirit brought that back. And He'll do that for you. He'll do it for all any, any of us. But that's how you control the thoughts. That's where, listen, every sin has its origin in our heart. Before you ever do it, you thought about it. You framed it. How you could make it happen. And you did it. That's why it's important to not touch. Get out of touch with the unclean things. Alright? Now, we have three things so far. Come out from among them. Be separate and touch not the unclean thing. Here's number four. Here's number four. And this really is God's move, but it's I will receive you. I will receive you. And really, that's the purpose of the other three moves. The other three moves of come out and be separate and touch not is that He'll receive me. God receives me if if. If Israel <clears throat> left Egypt but never went to the promised land, what good did it do to leave Egypt? The whole idea was, I'm getting you out of here so I can take you there. All right? That's the purpose of them getting out, was get to the promised land of blessing. Listen, God saved us, God redeems us, not just so we don't go to hell. God redeemed us, God saved us, so He can fellowship with us. So He can have a relationship with us. That's what He had with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He had a relationship with them, He had a fellowship with them. And when they sinned, that was broken. That was severed, and He had to separate them from the Garden. 
And, and listen, that's why Christ died. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Not, not those which were lost, though He saved those who were lost, but that which was lost was the fellowship God had with man. He's going he's gonna to make them at one again. That's the at one moment, the atonement. Bringing us back together with God. So we have a relationship with Him. If you're not having a relationship with God, you're not fulfilling the purpose for which God saved you. That's the most precious thing that we could ever desire. Most precious thing we could ever want. There are many people, listen, there are many people who are surrounding themselves and are on the Donald Trump bandwagon, so to speak, for presidency because, because he's a rich guy. Any athlete will tell you that. Pro athlete, once they hit it big, sign a big contract, they got all kinds of guys coming to them. Hey, I went to eighth grade with you. You know, I was, I was on the same basketball team as you back in seventh grade. You know, they don't matter. But they got all these people trying to come to them because they want a relationship because of what he's got. Hey, listen, more than anybody you could think of in the world, you and I, because of Jesus Christ, can have a personal relationship with God Almighty. Unbelievable. But there's only two ways that can happen. It's only two ways that we can have fellowship with God. Number one is God compromises His holiness so He can fellowship with us. How many of you think that's going to happen? <laughs> that's not going to happen. So the second thing has to happen, and that is I come out, I separate, I touch not the unclean thing, and He receives me. He receives me. Notice what it said again in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Are you back there? Notice he says, I will receive you, and notice what he says, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Are you saying, well, man, Pastor, you mean I've got to do this in order to be saved? That's not what it says. What, when God says receive there, the word receive is embrace you, and the key word there is I'll be a father to you. He already is your father, but that doesn't necessarily mean he can be a father to you. You've heard me talk about, well, uh, let's take the Bible example of the prodigal son. The man in the story had how many sons? Two. One, the younger, said, give me what's mine, and he left and went away. The, the older son stayed home. Now, all through that time, the Bible does not say how long he was gone, but the father never went running after him. He waited. Was he still that boy's father? Yes. Could he be a father to him? No. Didn't know where he was. Had no way to be a father unto him. But he could be a father to the son that was there, who was listening, who was obeying, who was still working, doing his job he could be a father to him there's there's Christians who have God as their father but he can't be a father to you because you are away from him he is your father that can't change you'll find out in Sunday in Hebrews 12 there's a time when it says where God is not ashamed to be called their God I had my, I had a brother, my brother's uh, gone now, and he went to heaven. He passed away several years ago of pancreatic cancer. And my brother didn't go the path that I went. My brother chose the path of going away from God. Spent most of his life, rarely if ever going to church. Didn't bring his family up in church at all. Smoke and drank. When he found out he had the cancer, he stopped everything. And they, he told me himself, and his wife did, when he stopped it all, they realized $400 a month more income. That's what he was spending on alcohol and cigarettes. And through those years, he, I remember when my dad told me that Scott called him and said that whenever there's family get-togethers, whenever there's you know, holidays and, you know, picnics and times we get together as a family. He says, I don't want to come, don't want to be invited. 
uh, I don't care to be around everybody. I broke my dad's heart. I understand it probably even more now that I have grown children than what I did then. But that was a great heaviness on my dad's heart. And there was always, listen, was, was he still a father to my brother? Yeah. But could he be a father to him? No, he couldn't. But I, I, listen, God by his grace allowed me to serve him. He called us into the ministry. We had a wonderful relationship. I not only had a father, he could be a father unto me. And we talked almost weekly, even when he, you know, when he lived in Florida. And, and, and he could be a father to me because of the path and the way I chose to live. You see, if I don't come out, if I don't be separate, if I will not touch, the, if, I, if I decide I'm going to go ahead and touch the unclean thing, God can't be a father to me. He can't embrace me like he would like to because he would compromise his holiness to do so. When we keep ourselves separated from the world and give ourselves to God, that's the best relationship that you'll ever experience. We heard testimonies at the RU conference of them saying that 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 the relationship they had with Jesus was better than any high of any drug they'd ever been on. That was their testimony several times. They said nothing compares to that. And they're right. Oh, that we would experience that. That we would know that. A king... A king was counseling one of his people. And this young man said he had a problem. He kept yielding to temptation. And he couldn't figure out how not to do that. And what the king did was he gave him a vessel. And he filled it nearly to the brim with oil. And he said, here's your job. Your job is to walk through the city and then come back and never spill a drop of oil. My soldiers will follow you. And if you spill a drop of oil, they have orders to kill you on the spot. You have to use the utmost care and caution. The young man took the vessel and began to go very carefully through the city. He hadn't gone far when he realized there was some bizarre or fair going on and man, there were all kinds of people and they were all jostling each other in the street and he just focused very carefully and walked through there and and so tried real hard not to spill a drop. He navigated through that crowd and finally returned back to the king and gladly announced he had the entire vessel and had never spilled one drop. And the king asked him, Who did you see when you passed through the city? The fellow said, I didn't see anybody. I was focused on not spilling a drop of the oil. He said, Well, what what kind of recreation did you get involved in? He said, None. He said, Well, what, what sins were you tempted to commit? He said, I didn't even think about it. All I was thinking about is not spilling any of that oil. That's all I was thinking about. Listen, listen. We've been given a precious treasure. It's a relationship with God. That is the most precious thing we could ever have. And our focus ought to be, listen, on having that relationship, not allowing anything to disrupt that relationship. We ought to treasure that so much that nothing else. We don't even see other things. We don't get distracted by other things. And anything that might take away from that precious relationship, we want nothing to do with.
is we'd lose that precious treasure of the closeness with God. I want to keep that fellowship intact. I'm serious about pleasing the Lord. Not a game. Serious business. Are you serious about it? Are you serious about your father-son, father-daughter relationship? That you won't let anything come between that? It's sweeter and it's more satisfying than anything the world can offer. Believe me when I say that. You can have, I can have people stand up in this room that have uh, had a relationship with Jesus for 30 years and 40 years and maybe 50 years and tell you how wonderful it is and how sweet it is and it just gets better. You won't find somebody who's lived in the world give a testimony like that. Because there's always an accompanying sorrow with whatever the world gives. Don't lose that precious relationship. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you and you will be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. What a privilege. Let's not squander that privilege. That's why we come out, we be separate, we touch not the unclean thing. You know why? Because He embraces me when I do that. I can be close to Him when He does that. And I don't want anything to mess that up. Ever. Let's stand together, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. And Lord, I pray that, oh, I pray that this truth will get into our hearts tonight. Thank you for being not a God that is afar off, but a God that is near. Desires that we have a relationship with you. An intimacy with you. Lord, we know that you won't compromise your holiness. We must be holy as you are holy. And so, Lord, help us tonight to follow. Help us tonight to make these decisions that will bring about your decision to receive us, to embrace us. Be a father unto us and we can be your sons and daughters. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm not going to have an invitation, but I wonder how many folks tonight would just say, Preacher, when you're closing prayer, I appreciate you praying for me. God spoke to my heart tonight about this issue. And I want to value, I want to see the treasure I have in my relationship with God. And I don't want anything to come in between that. And I will follow these decisions that, that you've taught tonight from 2 Corinthians. The Spirit of God has dealt with my heart. Pray for me tonight, Pastor. Will you put your hand up? Yes. Amen. Amen. All right, you may put them down. Father, thank you for speaking to hearts this evening. And Lord, I pray that each of us now would ask you for your help. The divine comforter, the one who's been called alongside to help us, the Holy Spirit, to enable us to live the Bible we've learned tonight. Oh, give us that relationship with you that you desire from us. Just a closer walk with thee. Granite Jesus is our plea. And so, Father, let us leave this place and make us mindful of your presence. Help us to please you in all we say and do this week. May others see Christ in our lives. And we'll thank you for it. We pray it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's sing together. Higher ground, all right? 246, if you need it. In the book, I'm pressing on the upward way. Let's hear you sing. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound, 
Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. God bless you. You are dismissed. Yeah.